We're randomly selecting Single Tracks podcast reviews to read on the show. If we choose yours, we'll send you free Single Tracks merch in the mail. This review is from Soon Time. Single Tracks help me get out there, have a blast, and get in shape. Using their information, I'm riding faster and safer. I have a new understanding of how to support good trails and respect the people and animals who share them. We're glad you're getting a lot out of the Single Tracks podcast soon time. And if this is your review, please send us an email at info at singletracks.com to claim your prize. And if you haven't reviewed the Single Tracks podcast yet, we'd love to hear from you and we might just read your review on the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Single Tracks podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my guest is Dr. Adam Faniff. Adam is a doctor of chiropractic with a degree in exercise science based in Bellingham, Washington. He's also a bike fitter and has studied bicycle biomechanics. Also, Adam was on the podcast with us several months ago talking about bike fit. So welcome back. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks again for having me back. So we last spoke in May, and I'm curious to know how things are going. Is the current bike boom affecting your business or the types of clients you've been seeing lately? I'd say, uh, well, you know, the the bike boom has had a tremendous positive impact on my business uh, pretty much since the start of the pandemic, and uh, and it's, it rolls on. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I think you know the, I think the whole bike industry is kind of is uh, is going a little bananas right now, and. Uh, I'm definitely seeing a lot more first time bike fits. Interesting. I think a lot of, a lot more people are getting into the sport. I mean, it makes kind of makes sense. There's a lot of people discovering the outdoors for the, you know, maybe the the second time in their life since they were a kid. <laughs> right. Yeah. And bikes have been a really good tool for that and, you know, and I get the best part with working with new riders too is that you know, the changes that we make are often really dramatic compared to experienced cyclists. Mm. And that can have a really dramatic impact on their riding. It probably keeps a lot more of these new riders in the sport because mm. they have a comfortable bike. It, uh, you know, there's a lot of barriers to even getting into the sport. And then there's a lot of barriers, barriers to sticking with the sport. So, um, yeah, I think we've had a, I've had a lot of people come in and they, they said, Oh my gosh, I just didn't know that this could be comfortable. I thought yeah, this was just yeah. how it was. <laughs> and then they're, they're even more stoked on riding, which, uh, which gets me stoked. And it's really, I mean, even from a trail advocacy standpoint, it's, it's beneficial for all these new riders to be sticking with the sport. Mm. The more people we have representing mountain biking, the better mountain biking is going to be represented in advocacy efforts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I know that I know. Yeah, people say it clogs up the trails a little more, but you know we're not getting more trails unless we have more support and more people backing mountain biking. So yeah, uh, I think that in the in the long run, that that all these new riders are they're beneficial to have for the sport. We need that new blood. Yeah, definitely a positive perspective. And yeah, I, I wonder the same thing about all these people getting into the sport right now and wondering whether they'll stick around. And yeah, it sounds like, you know, you're able to at least help one part of that. Like one of the excuses why people might not yeah. continue is like, Oh, it's uncomfortable. I mean, never mind that like it takes a lot of time and, you know, as other stuff opens back up, people might, you know, get out of the habit of riding, but yeah, that's cool to hear. Are you seeing people, maybe people too, that are riding more often than they had before? Like maybe people who can work from home now. And so, you know, they have that commute time freed up and so they're riding more, but then maybe getting like more overuse uh, type of injuries. Yeah, absolutely. Getting a lot lot more people uh, increasing their riding volume throughout the week, Mm -hmm. the, you know, with the, the advent of a lot of people working remotely. Yeah. And so all those, all those small discrepancies in their bike fit become a lot more prominent the more they ride. Right. So if they were just getting out for a quick 45 minutes, a few, few days a week, it wasn't really enough to precipitate the, uh, the small changes that would be need, yeah. need to be made with their fit. So, hmm. um, yeah, definitely brings those, those small items to the surface. Uh, once they start riding a lot more, definitely. Yeah. Interesting. Well, one of the like kind of general pieces of wisdom that a lot of us have heard, maybe people who aren't even bikers or they're new bikers is, uh, you hear a lot that cycling is like a low impact exercise that you can do, especially when compared to other activities like jogging. I want to know, is that generally true? Like is, is cycling really low impact or are there some caveats to that statement? 
aside from traumatic injuries <laughs> and, uh, uh, and certain injuries that are associated with mountain biking in particular, I'd say that it's generally true. You know, cycling is a non-weight-bearing form of exercise. It's low impact. It's easy on the joints, uh, easy on muscles and tendons. Mm-hmm. But I know, you know, with the, the low impact nature of cycling, it does have its benefits in that respect, but mm. it can also have its drawbacks. It doesn't load muscles and tendons to the same degree as running or traditional ball sports, mm-hmm. uh, but it also doesn't load your bones very much. Right. Yeah. And that, so that has bone density implications over time, okay. over the long haul. So for those who aren't familiar with that, essentially, you know, we accrue about 90% of our peak bone mass early in life, Mm -hmm. somewhere around age 18 to 20. So by the time you're about 20 years old, you're almost done accruing bone mass. And then it slowly deteriorates, or I guess that's a bad word for it, but (laughs) it slowly decreases over time. And uh, so as we age, we gradually lose bone density but there are ways that we can manage that diminishing bone mass. Hmm. And that's by loading our bones with weight-bearing exercise. Or, and that can mean higher impact activities. Or it can mean resistance training, like lifting some weights in the gym or you know at home. Cycling doesn't really fit into that weight-bearing category. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, it is a conversation that I have with a lot of, a lot of uh, cyclists that I work with, particularly those that operate at a high level mm-hmm. uh, for a long period of time. And all they're doing is either they're riding or they're resting. Mm-hmm. The, it, you know, we, ha- we usually have a conversation about long-term bone health and work on pursuing some sort of limited resistance training yeah. uh, or weight-bearing exercise on, on an intermittent basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, women are, are at higher risk for low bone density later in life, but men are not exempt from this either, especially men who use riding as their only form of exercise or activity. So right. it, it's, yeah, but aside from that, there are a lot of really, really nice benefits to riding. That's interesting because, yeah, we typically think when we hear low impact, like, oh, that's that's a good thing, but it can be too much of a good thing. It sounds like, you know, you need some of those impacts to, to strengthen bones, to keep them strong, from my understanding. And yeah, I mean, a lot of the things, I guess, that I think of personally, that when I talk to people, they'll say, oh, I used to run, but then I started having knee problems. And so then I started cycling. And so that's kind of the it's like cycling is the second choice for some athletes, maybe yeah. like it's the one that they like kind of graduate to. What are some of the like common ride related issues that folks tend to have? Like, do people tend to bring those same sort of injuries with them? Like if you had knee problems while you're running, are you going to potentially run into that on the bike? It can definitely occur in that pattern, uh, especially with, uh, with knee problems, People who tend to have knee pain, a kind of some low hanging fruit to, to look at is their running cadence. And those people tend to are, they're more likely to adopt a low cadence with riding as well. Yes. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of, there's a common denominator between running and riding of having a proper cadence. Okay. Uh, or else you're going to overload that knee joint. You're going to overload the tissues that help help move that knee joint. Yeah. So that's like in practical terms for a mountain biker, that means, yeah, choosing an easier gear Yep. sometimes, right? Like, yeah, not spinning in that hardest gear you can push, but maybe, you know, moving your legs faster, but in an easier gear. Exactly. Yeah. And some people are more likely to try and grind. Um, and some people are more likely to adopt a higher cadence naturally. Yeah. I'm a grinder for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I think we've all been at one point or another. Yeah. You know, other than that, you know, statistically the most common complaints with riding are low back pain and neck pain. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say that, you know, you're, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a cyclist that hasn't experienced those at one point or another. You know, I see a fair amount of that, but again, knee pain is a big one. And, uh, as well as, you know, numbness in varying locations and uh, in particular with uh, with mountain biking, wrist pain and uh, elbow pain, and definitely a common denominator with all disciplines of cycling is foot discomfort as well. Though it's not as common as you know low back pain, neck pain, knee pain. I'd say back and neck and knee pain are probably the the biggest ones that that come through uh, come through my office. Mm, yeah, 
Is that, I mean, is that something just inherent with a bike? Like we're asking our body to do something that's like not totally natural, but doable as long as we do it the right way. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there, I think that there are, uh, there's a wide variety of reasons why we experience those types of discomfort. Mm -hmm. It's a new sport for you. It's a new position for you to be in with your body. Yeah. And you're going to experience some low level soreness from that, Mm -hmm. that improves over time. And that's where a lot of those reports kind of come in aside from the elite level where they're just on the bike for a really long period of time in really aggressive positions. And you're not going to get away from some sort of discomfort because it's in the name of performance. Typically comfort helps aid performance, but there, again, there are situations where you have to sacrifice comfort in the name of of performance Um, where people approach me is when they, you know, especially new riders, they get out of that. uh, They either get out of that initial, you know, muscle soreness, discomfort phase, or they have problems that persist beyond that first week of riding. And they, they, they say, this isn't normal, or this is uncomfortable. Yeah. And then that's where that's where I usually kind of come into their their plan for their for riding. Mm. Interesting. Another thing, another common, you know, I, I know I mentioned shoulder injury, you know, shoulder discomfort, mm-hmm. particular with mountain biking. And I really think, you know, that's definitely more particular to mountain biking because flat bars, they do offer a lot more control, mm-hmm. but they also offer an opportunity for us to place our shoulder in a vulnerable or less than ideal position. Hmm. Interesting. It demands that we have a, a stable shoulder while we're providing input into the bike. And sometimes it's easy to lose that or we get put in positions where we do lose that. And then we have to load other tissues in our shoulder or arm that aren't really used to taking that amount of, uh, of load. Yeah. Interesting. So is that the kind of thing where, I mean, it sounds like you're saying maybe drop bars, are those more like ergonomically correct, I guess, for riding? Or is that going to give people more comfort, but less control? Correct. Yeah. And I mean, it also depends on the position uh, or it depends on what you're riding. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I would never say drop bars are going to be are going to be best for riding single track. They, you know, they provide a comfortable position, but they don't provide a very stable position mm-hmm. and they don't it doesn't attenuate force very well. So it's comfortable, but it has a ceiling mm-hmm. and there's a very good reason that flat bars exist. Yes. We can we can attenuate for more force with that position, uh, but it does um, it does have its ability to break down as well. It does have a ceiling as well. So yeah, and it's these days there's so many choices too. I mean, there's there's flat bars and there's curly bars, but then there's like everything in between. And it's like you know I feel like we have a lot of those choices, and we can make those tweaks to like kind of get the advantages of both to have the control, but also have the comfort. Another product that comes to mind when talking about that is like oval chain rings. And that's something that at least to me has been sold as a way to reduce knee pain. Also potentially to like get a little more power, which I don't know if that's true or if people agree with that, but I'm curious to hear your opinion about like what oval chain rings are good for and and basically how do they work? Well, yeah, oval chain rings are definitely, they've definitely seen a bit of a popularity increase, especially in the mountain biking world. They kind of had their phase in the road, in the road riding world, and some people still subscribe to using them. But, you know, beyond, beyond, you know, anecdotal evidence, uh, most of the literature is pretty conflicting uh, as to whether or not there's, a performance or even biomechanical benefit to oval rings. Yeah. (laughs) Conflicting would be the word. There's really only one study out there that really addresses loading at the knee with oval versus circular chain rings. And in that study, they really found no significant difference uh, in forces at the knee. Interesting. Again, that's only one study though. The studies are limited. There could be something that comes out down the line that totally changes our opinion on that. Right. But I also looked at, I've looked at some studies and one study that I came across was, uh, it compares muscle activation at the kind of the quad and, and hip. Uh, and it compared oval rings with circular rings. 
and they uh, they compared it in you know relatively trained cyclists. So we know they can be applicable to the si- to the riding population. Mm-hmm. And so what it found, you know, they they did some some output tests at a high cadence and output tests at a low cadence, and th- there wasn't really much of a difference at a higher cadence. Uh, but they did find that there were higher levels of muscle activation in these key muscles at around seventy. Uh, revolutions per minute so kind of at a lower cadence yeah for grinders like me I, exactly I, yeah <laughs> I think maybe i need to need to reevaluate that right yeah and i mean there how much can we really draw from that one study i mean that remains to be seen mm-hmm. does this mean that knees could be more tolerant of a low cadence with an oval ring hmm. Maybe, but we really just don't have enough of enough available evidence to really suggest that or conclude that and, you know, I'd really look towards cadence as an issue with, with a, um, alleviating knee pain or bike fit as, as a, with alleviating knee pain uh, rather than the shape of the ring on the front of your bike. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and I guess I'm kind of minimalist. I, I like to use what, I, what we have in front of us and make it work with that. Mm-hmm. But that's just kind of how that's kind of how I do things. And that's, you know, some people you know, they like to buy gear and they, if they feel, if it makes a difference for them, whether it's placebo or not, <laughs> going to be happy with that too. I mean, right. And there were, you know, there were a couple other studies that, that I've seen in the past that, you know, they like compared like actual changes in biomechanics mm-hmm. with varying oval ring options. Cause there's not just one shape of oval ring out there and not, there's, you know, there's a bunch of different options out there. They all are varying degrees of, oval ovality i guess <laughs> right. uh, yes some of them is. are more look more like an oval and some of them look a lot closer to a circle osymmetric being one of those like the more aggressive ones mm-hmm. as far as brands go and so anyway there really wasn't a statistically significant difference with oval versus circular uh as far as how your body moves and how knee, joint angles change through pedal stroke yeah except with the most aggressive with the most aggressive oval rings like the osymmetric ring okay i'm not being paid by osymmetric to mention them but <laughs> <laughs> they, they're just one of the one of the most aggressive brands out there and again oval rings they don't always have in the mountain biking world we can get away with it because we have really good ways of managing chain tension and mm-hmm. A lot of us are running one by at this point, uh, so we don't really have to worry about changing to, uh, you know, f- changing a front derailleur around. Mm-hmm. But in the road cycling world, those more aggressive oval rings, they're not really feasible to use in a road racing scenario uh, where you are switching between two front rings. Uh, you can have chain drop and, you know, especially, I mean, that's why you don't really see it at the elite level uh, very often is because it's, it's unreliable with shifting. And I think in general, I just think, you know, as far as all the studies go, there hasn't been much shown to prove any dramatic benefit Mm -hmm. between the two. And I think, you know, when you look at the elite level, you know, if if oval rings were dramatically better than a circular ring, there would be a lot of people using it at the highest level. Right. It would, it would be across the board, you know, and we also have to look at, you know, when we are looking at, 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 studies in general we have to look at where the who's funding the research Mm. we have to you know to determine if there is some bias i mean you could have uh you could have a company that funds a study and you know they want to find something (laughs) that supports that says oval rings are the best thing ever but and as far as you know like that that argument of power output or that thought oh it might improve your power a little bit Mm -hmm. some of the things Sometimes we see a little bit of, you know, people who do use power meters. Sometimes the power meter isn't calibrated for the oval ring itself. Oh, interesting. And so, yeah, without calibrating your power meter, you will see up to a 4% bump in power output, but it's really just Mm -hmm. your power meter not being able to read it effectively. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of people in town here that I know that, that do use oval rings on their mountain bike mm-hmm. and they feel it provides a more even power through the pedal stroke. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that the argument is that, you know, you'll have better traction and technical climbing. Right. There really isn't any evidence to back that up at this time, but I'm not going to steer someone away from an oval ring if they have that sensation and they like it and it works for them. Yeah. And 
concurrently, I'm not going to suggest someone go out and buy an oval ring if they have a perfectly good circular ring on their bike. Right, right. Yeah. If they have a strong interest in trying it out, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say no, but I'm, I'm not going to claim that you need an oval ring to be the best mountain biker you can be or to have a good time on your mountain bike. Right. Or, or prevent pain on your mountain bike. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, we're not, the whole point of this is not to pick on oval chain rings too. And I feel like that was a perfect example of like so many things on our bikes and where there's the first part of it, which is some people have tried it and it works for them and they like it and that's it. Like, good for them. They can go off and do it. And then there's the other side of, you know, there's research and there's science behind this. And there's even a lot of tried and true things. Like you said, like the round chain ring, like it's been around a long time and nobody's been able to really improve on it in a lot of ways. And so like the truth maybe is kind of in the middle exactly on a lot of these things. And, you know, it's like mullet bikes and yeah, all kinds of other debates that we have outside of even bike fit, you know, is it good or bad? Well, you know, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder in a lot of ways. It's true. I mean, and if, when it comes down to it, if you like the way it feels and you're having fun, I think that is the core mountain biking right there. So yeah, again, I, w- I would not, I would not, I don't really take a hard stance on oval chain rings because yeah, a lot of people like them and some people, they like what they have in a circular chain ring. And then there is, there is one little thing with oval chain rings and there was a study that I read a while back and it, it talked about sprint performance mm. and they did find some, some benefit with, uh, with an oval ring with sprinting. Mm. So, you know, for all you BMX track racers <laughs> right. out there. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so, I mean, there again, just because the research doesn't exist now doesn't mean that it won't in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to, we have to keep an open mind with these things and be willing to have our preconceived notions challenged and even proven wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That's the tension, which is really interesting is between those two things. It's like, we want to be rigorous and scientific about it, but we also want to keep an open mind and say, huh, like maybe there is something here and and we need to look into it. And I find the psychology side fascinating as well. You mentioned that for some people, perhaps it's a placebo effect. And then the question is like, well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> like people are okay with that. They're like, it makes me feel better and I feel faster. So that's pretty much makes me faster. And so, yeah, when we talk about these studies and we really try to explain it, maybe we're ruining the magic. Could be. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the same thing where if you, if you like what you look at in the garage, you're more likely to get out and ride it and be happy riding it. So, I mean, right. if you like the color of your bike and it makes you feel fast, yes, then <laughs> it might be faster than if it was a bike you, you don't even like looking at. I mean, it's, yes, there's so much to it. And I, yeah. And I think that the enjoyment and stoke factor does come into play with a lot of things. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get uh, sort of selfish with this next question and say that I test a lot of different bikes, a lot of different mountain bikes throughout the year. And with each new bike that I test, there's often kind of this early period with the new bike where it feels uncomfortable to me in one way or another. Usually though, it kind of goes away after several rides. So I guess I'm getting used to the bike or like the discomfort disappears. Like, is that normal for people to have this kind of like breaking in period with a new bike where their body kind of adapts to the bike? I would say it depends, but in short, yes, there can be a little bit of an adaptation period. So when you hop on a new bike, it's not going to be, unless it's the exact same bike as your old bike and you're on a crash replacement or something like that. Yeah the geometry of the bike is going to be different. Your reach numbers are going to be different. Your position relative to, or kind of the position of your body relative to the location of certain key components on the bike mm-hmm. is going to be different. You can get your bike totally set up, you know, with the same degree of knee extension through your pedal stroke, mm-hmm. but your torso angle, you know, how forward you're, how far forward you're bending and say your knee position relative to where the pedal spindle is Mm -hmm. can differ from bike to bike, even though you have it set up about the same as your last bike. 
Right. So it changes your pelvic tilt, changes how far how far forward you're leaning, uh, how much quadriceps you're recruiting relative to hamstring and glute max. There can be some break in period with that. And the same thing kind of goes for bike fit. When somebody comes in and we make some changes, I say give this a good six to eight hours on this bike before you make any real big assumptions. Yeah. Six to eight hours of ride time, I guess you're saying. Yep. Six to eight hours. Yep. Yeah. Not 68, but six to eight. <laughs> That'd be a long, a long time on the bike. Not just like go home and think about it over the afternoon. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Put, put in yeah. some saddle time. Yeah. So, I mean, it, and yeah, your body has to, your body's a, adapting to a new position, whether it's a new bike or a new bike fit. Um, you're, you're recruiting different muscles at different percentages and it's, it's going to be something that your body is unfamiliar with. It's just like doing, it's just a smaller scale of like moving to a different sport or trying a new activity. You're going to have, you're going to be using different muscles in different, in slightly different ways or slightly different capacities than you were mm-hmm. previously. So yeah. I'd say it's, you know, the, yeah. And that, so the long answer is also yes, <laughs> that <laughs> it is normal to experience a little bit of kind of break in time during, uh, during your first several hours on a new bike. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that too. I mean, I guess, I, I mean, I have, I've known many people who, when they're getting a new bike, they're looking at, you know, keeping certain uh, numbers the same, right? They want like a similar reach or a uh, similar saddle height and that sort of thing. But at the same time, like bikes are, especially in mountain biking, the geometries are just progressing so much every year. And so, you know, maybe you have a Santa Cruz tall boy and fits you great and you're used to riding it, you've been riding it for years, and then you're ready to get the the latest model and it's going to be different. I mean, it's going to have different reach. It's going to have a lot of things about it that your body's going to have to adapt to. So how do you know when it's like too much when the bike is, is really just like not the right fit for you? Yeah. I think that six to eight hour mark is a really good indicator as to whether something is going to persist or not. Okay. If it's a theme beyond that, you know, first one to two weeks of riding, then it's probably going to stick around for a while. Mm. yeah there's it's it's highly unlikely that that's going to change unless you change something Mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily again like the way that i see it is it's not necessarily a problem with you or your biomechanics it's just you're not the bike is not matched to your biomechanics it's not matched how you move not matched to your strengths your flexibility and it doesn't mean you need to get a new bike but it does mean that either this bike is different than your last bike and mm-hmm. we can't do everything the same way as the last bike right or yeah or means we need to make a few tweaks yeah and i imagine the the tweaks are going to be some combination of like tweaking your form like the way you're sitting on the bike or the way that you're moving your body or they're going to be modifying the bike get like different width of handlebar or different stem or that sort of thing right yeah, you know, cockpit setup is its is its own kind of uh, own kind of animal, and that does mm-hmm. change bike to bike. But I'd say with you know adapting the bike to you know riding style or modifying how we ride, I think that you should kind of have a couple different people in your corner. You know, you you should have some sort of professional, like some sort of bike fitter that will be able to address some of the the base of the pyramid where. Mm okay, fit looks good, mechanics look sound, at least, you know, in a, in a controlled setting. It's not the bike. It's not the way that your bike is matched. It's not a problem with the bike matching your biomechanics mm-hmm. or, you know, or your, your, your dimensions of your body. Then another person having have in your corner would be some sort of skills coach. Mm. More often than not, you know, we are just failing to adapt the bike to our normal biomechanics. And changing those biomechanics can often be an unrealistic expectation. But... Sometimes it's the way that we handle the bike that is causing our discomfort. And that's where working with a skills coach or even a rehab professional can really come in handy. Yeah. Well, for me, it's, I guess it's unusual because I'm always like having photos taken of me riding a bike or like, you know, videos. And, and then of course I've also got my wife, Leah, who tells me all the time, you look like you're slouched over when you're riding your bike, you bend over too much. And, and she's right. You know, like you do need that that outside perspective to be like, huh, I didn't realize I was doing that and and becoming conscious of it and, and trying to fix it. Yeah. can alleviate a lot of those issues. 
Yeah, absolutely. I would agree 100%. Well, we're going to take a break real quick, but when we come back, we're going to talk about arm pump, saddle tilt, and other bike fit issues. Stay tuned. The next time you're shopping for mountain bike gear, check out singletracks.com slash deals. Each week, we share our favorite product picks and exclusive coupon codes from our partners. You can also use the page to search for whatever you're buying, from complete mountain bikes to brake sets and tire sealant. That's singletracks.com slash deals. And to get our weekly picks delivered to your inbox, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. Links to the newsletter and deals page are in the show notes. And we're back. So one question, Adam, I know that a lot of mountain bikers have is about arm pump. So I'm curious to get your take on what arm pump is and kind of what causes it. So arm pump, we've all experienced it at one point or another, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, it's essentially a symptom of certain muscles in your forearm fatiguing. Mm. And these muscles, they control your wrists, they control your fingers, Things that are too, you know, a lot of joints that are really important, especially in the descending aspect of mountain biking. Right. And really, the the com- what what muscles are involved they vary upon presentation, but it's almost always a sign that something is amiss in the cockpit setup. And I mean, there kind of goes along. It can go along with kind of what we talked about a little earlier with skills coaching and managing body position, uh, shoulder position, putting yourself in a position where you're able to attenuate all the forces, the forces involved with descending with more of your body than just your arms and your wrists. Mm -hmm. But you know, this could have cockpit setup implications as well. The matching terrain selection to your cockpit is super important. Mm. So if you're riding super steep stuff all the time or you're riding low angle stuff all the time, you should match your brake angle to that so that you're not putting your wrist in this non-neutral position while you're gripping and putting load through your hand and your wrist and your elbow. Yeah. So if, if we're not matching that neutral, you know, if we're not matching our terrain with a neutral wrist and forearm position, then we're going to be stressing these muscles extra essentially. So we're going to be putting them under load and tensioning them under load too much. And then that's where we get that arm pump. I also think that well-tuned brakes go a long way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you're just, if you're working too hard or you're, you know, your, your lever throw isn't ideal, it's too short or too long. You can stress some of these muscles as well. Yeah. When you're like death gripping the handlebars sort of, or, you know, like you really have to pull the brake levers hard. Yeah. You're obviously like activating those tendons and everything in your arms and that that's not good. Yeah. And you know, again, I can't reiterate enough how much, how important it is to match your brake angle to the type of terrain that you ride, you know, on average, um, you should, yeah, you should have that, that brake angle kind of match that upper percentage of, of your most common terrain selection. Yeah. Do you think most people run their brake levers too high or too low? I would say that there's two different crowds. There are people who come from a XC background and run them very steep. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily jive with modern geometries. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who spend a lot of time on Instagram (laughs) and follow certain enduro riders that do ride really, really, really rowdy stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and they throw their brake levers probably a little too raked out than they actually need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Usually you kind of end up meeting halfway with that, that current position, what, you know, what the average neutral position is, but it's kind of all over the board. It's all, it all depends on, you know, some people just like the way it looks too. And, and not there. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that mountain biking is more about the feeling than it is how it looks. So, yeah. And that's just a personal philosophy, but, and there are a lot of people who ride truly steep, truly gnarly stuff. And Mm -hmm. that's part of, again, part of having an honest conversation about terrain selection and knowing 
as a bike fitter, knowing what trails are in town and knowing what they look like and understanding the needs of each rider. Yeah, it's good too. I mean, when you started off describing arm pump, you know, you mentioned how it's, it's fatigue, it's muscle fatigue. And I think we've all felt that we can recognize that, but our initial reaction is always like, Oh, I need to get stronger. Yeah. And yeah. to me, like getting stronger is like, Oh, geez, what do I got to lift weights now? Or like, you know, I don't want to do that stuff, but it's, so it's really reassuring to know that, you know, part of it is cockpit setup. You can deal with, with some of the pain issues that way. And then also, yeah, just how you're kind of holding onto the bike and how your shoulders and arms and everything are, are kind of connected to that. And, and you can alleviate it that way as well. Exactly. I can't stress enough how important skills coaching is and how beneficial it can be for the average rider. Even just a little bit of time with a skills coach can go such a long way. Yeah. Because, yeah, you can have your bike set up totally ideal for what you typically ride. But if you're not putting your body in the right position in the moment, then it's kind of a moot point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would also say that if you're doing a really, really, really long descent, your arms are going to be tired at the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's especially a really long, steep or, you know, chattery descent there. We have to have some reasonable expectations for how you're going to feel <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Nobody feels fresh after, you know, three or 4,000 feet of descending. So yes, this is normal. Good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're, you're talking about chattery descents and one of the things that I'm also wondering about is vibration on the bike. And I, I really noticed this. I've started to do a bit of gravel riding, like on, you know, a rigid bike and certainly feel a lot of vibration there. And, and even anytime I watch like helmet cam footage from my own helmet, I realize like how much my head is just shaking around. Maybe it's just the helmet. Hopefully it's mostly the helmet <laughs> moving independently and my head is not being vibrated to that degree. But it, what kind of health issues can come from repeated vibration like that? Uh, well, yeah, certainly muscle fatigue, like we were talking about, excessive vibration fatigues muscles. And then it causes us, you know, after we, you know, fatigue those muscles, we rely on something called passive stability, um, which is ligaments, joints, things that, you know, things that are not muscle or tendon, essentially. Um and then numbness can also occur too. Um, I don't know if you've ever used like a, a, a trimmer or anything. Uh, I was just going to say that leaf blower. Oh my goodness. Like you hold one of those handheld ones after, yeah, like 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. You just can't even feel your arm anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your, your muscles and nerves will be shot for a little bit of time. So, yeah. and the higher the frequency, the vibration, the quicker that fatigue factor occurs. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, and we, you see this a lot more in like cyclocross and especially gravel applications because you're running a, a rigid bike and in gravel, you're running, riding for hours at a time and you're really relying solely on tire pressure and muscles and joints to handle all the forces that are coming through. Yeah. So, so are things like, I mean, it sounds like it's definitely more noticeable on a gravel bike where you don't have suspension. So can things that aren't suspension, like maybe a suspension stem or like a suspension seat post, are those legitimate? A lot of times as mountain bikers, we kind of scoff at those and say like, that's silly, that doesn't work. But, but in terms of comfort, like, can it work? Does it work? Yes, it can definitely work. I don't think that it's for everybody. Uh, and I think that the technology has definitely come a long way over the last decade. I think there's a lot more, a lot more out there. The, you know, suspension stems and seat posts, seat posts, um, are, they're a good way to kind of take some of the chatter out, handle some of those forces, mm -hmm. especially I think they can pay dividends longer, uh, into the ride uh, as you get later and later into a long ride. And again, it's also what kind of, gravel roads you're looking to ride. Um, mm -hmm. if you're riding a right. lot of washboard, it, you, you'll probably be very happy that you did it, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, not all that technology is created equal. Mm -hmm. Some stuff is better than others. Mm -hmm. Some of it is, uh, gives you a better, um, just kind of take some of the chatter out, uh, like some of the spring oriented stuff. Mm -hmm. It, you know, uh, it takes some of that chatter out. Some of it, like, uh, some of it is, uh, is air driven, 
like the PNW components has a has a great little uh, gravel dropper post that has some suspension to it. That's better for those kind of those hard hits that you're not expecting, and it doesn't you know shred your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. And then there's, you know, there's, uh, you know, elastomer based stuff. Um, but again, the technology has gotten a lot better. There's a lot more options for people. Uh, I've also had plenty of, um, individuals pursue those kind of things because they have had some sort of surgery in the past and it just takes this, takes the edge off for them. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. And there's, there's even kind of, there's even a set of, there's a set of mountain bike bars out there that have flexible, kind of has like a bit of a flexible joint to them. And I, I, there are people out there that have had, you know, wrist surgeries, they have hardware in their arms and, and wrists and stuff. And it just, again, it takes the edge off for those people. So hmm. I think that the average person, you know, I'm not going to say you need it, uh, but there are a lot of ways to help deload, you know, either like a pre existing condition you know, post-surgical things Mm -hmm. or just uh, somebody who is riding a lot of really bumpy stuff and they're just not comfortable at the end of the ride. So it's, and it's something worth exploring if they are married to riding a rigid bike with a, you know, with whatever tire size that they're running. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good advice because I think a lot of us, we do tend to dismiss some of these products just for performance reasons, right? Saying like, oh, well, you're not going to have as much control or... Or you're losing power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. But but it makes a lot of sense in terms of comfort and even for some people, just even to be able to get out on the bike. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you see patterns in some of your clients uh, in terms of the, the type of bike that they ride? Like, are people on carbon gravel bikes more likely to be experiencing issues than say someone on a steel gravel bike. Do you, can you see that difference in terms of like the types of bikes people are riding? I haven't seen any trends personally. That is a really good question though. Uh, I think I see more of a trend with people running lower volume tires uh-huh. and having a little bit more discomfort. So mm-hmm. making the the leap to a higher volume tire can be a great way to add a little bit more of that, that plushness to your ride. Yeah. That and tire selection comes into play too. I mean, really when you're working with a gravel bike, the, t- the tire and wheel has a lot of impact on your experience. Yeah. You can be bouncing around on a 32 C tire if you want, but mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, th- there's, there's a lot, a lot of benefit to that higher volume tire. If you are looking for comfort. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. You cleared up a lot for me. I hear people, gravel people, talking all the time about their tire size. It's a big topic of conversation. And it's always like, well, what's the biggest tire you can fit in your frame? Yeah. So now I know <laughs> it's because yeah. they're like, they're in pain and they're like, can I get a bigger tire, please? Like, so, yeah. Yeah. I'd say my sweet spot personally is around a 47C for general gravel riding. Oh, wow. Yeah, that sounds big. Yeah, it does sound big. But, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not racing gravel. We have a lot of, a lot of the gravel riding around Bellingham is not smooth Mm -hmm. and having a higher volume tire, both for puncture protection and, uh, and for smoothing out the ride can be really helpful. Mm. So it really, again, it's, it's not, I do not claim that it, it is the fastest setup, but it is comfortable and hasn't stranded me yet. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those are important things. Yeah, I'm um, sure. Th- yeah. And I know I, there, I know some people that run smaller tires and they certainly do go faster on them though. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about trade-offs. Exactly. I was about to say that. Yeah. It's you're you're making a compromise one way or the other. Yeah. Well, one other question I have is about how bike fit changes, if at all, for us based on the type of riding we're doing. So one example for a lot of mountain bikers is like, we have our trail bike that we ride, you know, sort of during the week or maybe on the weekends for a couple hours at a time. Would the same fit, same bike fit for that sort of trail bike work for longer riding, like say bike packing? When people come in for a bike fit, do you, do you fit all their bikes at once or are they able to kind of translate that between their different bikes? Uh, a lot of good questions there. Bike fit really, um, especially with mountain bike fit, it should match terrain selection first and foremost. Okay. So if your bike packing route is pretty flat 
and doesn't involve a lot of steep climbing, but your daily daily rides mean a really steep fire road climb, mm-hmm. your fit is going to be different. Uh, your saddle okay. tilt will be different. And the way that we try and balance you on the bike will probably be a little bit different because riding a loaded bike, as anybody who's done some bike packing will attest, does weight the bike differently. And when, you know, when you're, when you're fully packed up there, it is a different animal to handle. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Cause I was, I was thinking that, you know, maybe the time was the thing that's different, but already you're saying it, it even depends on the terrain, right? If you are climbing versus doing a lot of flat stuff like that even affects your fit. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, and there are ways that you can make a bike more comfortable, the the good thing is with mountain biking is we're seeing a lot more uh you know we're seeing a lot more steeper seat tube angles so you're generally in a more upright position on mountain bikes and you could certainly bike pack with with your mountain bike um i'd say there's some small nuance between the two but yeah again you don't want to be on a bike that's meant for aggressive climbing and then go out for you know a flatter route on it where you're spending lots of time fighting a saddle tilt that's not going to support uh support you yeah so things even like like saddle height that seems to be like kind of a a basic thing in terms of bike fit is that going to be the same between all these different bikes that people are going to have set up saddle height it it definitely depends on the geometry of the bike so if you're going between bikes um it will be different um when we do change saddle tilt it places you in a different position on the saddle relative to the bottom bracket right so there will be a small height change sometimes or a small fore aft change with that hmm. sometimes you know depending on the ge- geometry of the bike sometimes it's negligible and we can get away with it you know it's like i'm doing one bike packing weekend on this bike i'm just going to make it work and yeah. you know in all likelihood it won't create too much discomfort like kind of like we've been talking about you know have this theme of kind of meeting somewhere in the middle mm-hmm. and that you know the truth is really not on either opposite end of the spectrum it's kind of somewhere in the middle mm-hmm. probably get away with it in a lot of cases but Going from bike to bike, uh, transferring measurements can get a little tricky because you are geometries do change, and that changes the position of your body relative to certain key components of the bike. Right. Interesting. So the short answer is yes and no, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh, It depends. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, you mentioned saddle tilt, and that's one that, I don't know, I feel like for most people – there's just sort of this rule of thumb, you know, well, a lot of us just eyeball it, right? Like when we're setting up a new bike or we change saddles and particularly for mountain biking, I'm curious if the saddle tilt, like the thinking on that, has it changed with dropper posts in terms of you basically now you only have your saddle set up for climbing for descending. You really don't, don't care what the angle is or any of that. Right. So, so what is, how do you kind of dial in that, that saddle tilt? Exactly. So it's definitely important to have a conversation with the individual before you even begin the bike fitting process, or I guess that is the, the beginning of the bike fitting process is having a conversation yeah. and understanding where they're riding you know, what they're riding, it, are they, you know, are they riding undulating terrain, you know, a lot of flat, flatter or undulating terrain where they're pedaling through a lot of low angle terrain, I guess, so to say, mm-hmm. or are they essentially going up the steepest fire road in town, steepest logging road in town, and then riding down something. So having, uh, that will help set expectations for saddle tilt uh, during the fitting session and then uh, also starting, you know, I think people have different, different ideas as to what a new, neutral saddle position is as far as tilt goes. So I do my best to get them into a neutral position and kind of work from there and, um, and kind of mimic their, uh, the degree of, you know, the degree of pitch that they're riding up. And also understanding that people, you know, saddles, there's a lot of, there's a a million saddles out there, but they have one on their bike and they typically want to keep that one. Mm -hmm. And knowing that everybody's pelvis is a slightly different width Mm -hmm. um, as far as where, you know, sit bones and pubic bone are. So they're going to find their ideal position on that saddle 
in a different spot than somebody else might. Mm. It's, uh, as we all know, you know, saddles kind of sweep outwards as you go towards the back of the saddle. Right. And so you're going to try and marry that ischial tuberosity with, with the, that, uh, specific position on that saddle, uh, where it feels comfortable, where it's not too narrow, it's not too wide. And so again, that's going to vary person to person. And, you know, working with, um, uh, working with saddle mapping can help with that. But I think again, having a good conversation beforehand and understanding like, okay, well, you know, you're riding up some really steep stuff. We're going to be okay with some negative tilt, some kind of downward nose down saddle tilt, because once we get going up on that steep logging road, it's going to feel a lot more natural. And that's where it, that's where it's important. Yeah. But the XC racer, you know, it's going to be a lot more akin to a, to a road bike saddle tilt, a nice neutral, neutral saddle tilt. Um, especially with the way that a lot of saddles have some, have a, have a lot of really good decompression or cut out, however, however you want to talk about it. They, you know, it allows you to tilt forward into that saddle and not experience discomfort like you would with a, a saddle without a cutout. So it allows for a little bit more wiggle room and it keeps you happy in kind of that neutral riding or, you know, low angle terrain. And then if you do go up a, you know, a steep kick, then it's not going to ruin your day uh, or create numbness or pain there. But if you are, if all you do is ride up steep stuff, then you, we can afford to have a little bit of a negative saddle tilt. I've definitely seen some stuff out there that's very, very aggressive. Yeah. And I think, and we've often raised that nose up and they find that they are much more comfortable than they thought they could be. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, you know, it, sometimes we have to kind of go to those extremes to understand what's comfortable, what's not, uh, and then meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here with a question that I just thought of that we have heard a bit about in mountain biking, which is cleat placement. And a lot of riders who ride with flat shoes and flat pedals tend to place their foot more like midfoot on the pedal um, versus what you would normally get from a clipless shoe. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts on that about a lot of riders, what they seem to be doing is really scooting those cleats farther back, farther toward the midfoot. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or is it just a neutral thing? As long as you're comfortable and, and you feel like you have better control, then that's what you should do. Yeah, that's an awesome question. I'd say that it depends on the goals mm-hmm. that the rider has, uh, you know, if they're, it, and, and it depends on how much they want to be able to recruit their calf at a certain period of time. So having that cleat kind of right in the middle of that kind of in between the edge, kind of in between the base of your first toe and your fifth toe, kind of having the pedal spindle kind of bisect that area works really well for people who want to really recruit calf, you know, heavily and have the best you know, pedaling power output, but feel with descending often improves with getting that cleat further back. So yeah. a lot of people, and, and it recruits less calf during your pedal stroke. So hmm. if you want to spare your calf for descending, which we use a lot to attenuate force uh, when we're descending, scooching that cleat back is something that is, you know, frequently done, at least in my, my experience, they, you know, it allows you to, the further back that cleat is, it allows you to drop your heel a little bit better on steeper descents uh, and really mimic some of the that benefit that you do get from a flat pedal right. and some of that feel. So it's not, it you know, you only have so much room to work mm-hmm. with, a, with a clipless shoe. The good thing is, you know, it's, it is, a, most clipless shoes are fairly supportive in the sole. So you can kind of get away with that wiggle room with where the cleat is. It's not going to, you're not going to be hinging your foot over that point. So, Hmm. but yeah, I tend, I do tend to err on, you know, with the guys who ride steeper stuff or yeah, want to be able to, you know, play around with their bike a little bit more. Uh, We can err on that, that more rearward cleat position, especially yeah, for steeper descending, because it really does allow you to drop those heels, get your center of gravity lower. And you just feel like, you're not re- constantly recruiting your calf muscles just to keep your foot neutral. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's super helpful. Well, one final question I want to ask you about is the rise of this idea of like video and online bike fitting. You know, we're seeing a lot of things going online, especially with the pandemic, all these uh, Zoom calls that we can't get away from. But 
we're starting to see this where like companies are even claiming they can use like artificial intelligence to to help you with your bike fit. Like what what do you think about that? Is is that something that is here to stay? Is that a technology maybe um, traditional bike fitters can incorporate, or or is this kind of something that maybe is not going to work out as well? It's the worst thing I've ever heard of. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> of course you would say that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that I think that there are there are a few really good resources out there online uh, that use AI, and I think they offer a really good starting point for a lot of individuals. It's low cost. It may take a little bit more time to do yourself than an actual bike fitting session session uh, with a uh, you know in person. It offers flexibility for people who, you know, can't get to a bike fitter. They live in a town that just doesn't have a good bike fitter um, and they want that. They want something or they, you know, they aren't having any discomfort or anything. They just got a new bike. They want to get a basic setup idea. Um, and then those, you know, those those AI uh, apps and softwares can really offer a good starting point, in my opinion. Some of them will t- even take you through like a brief mobility screen. And, you know, I can certainly get on board with that idea. Um, being, you know, a rehab professional and, uh, but you know, there are, you know, I I think the, that the, there are some drawbacks in comparison to meeting in person, Mm -hmm. you know, the, um, the first thing is again, you can't really, you don't really get to have that conversation with someone to discuss, you know, especially in the mountain biking world, like what terrain do you ride? You know, what are your goals? How have you been feeling on your bike? Are we solving any specific issues? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, the, you know, the, the AI can, you know, find certain landmarks on your body pretty well, but yeah, it's not really good at troubleshooting specific complaints or dealing with cockpit setup. Uh, I think that's, and there's a lot of nuance with that with mountain biking in particular. And a lot of them just view things from one side. So they'll just view you from your right side. And some people have different leg lengths or they have two different shoe sizes that affect fit. So one size, one side isn't going to be exactly the same as the other, or you have a previous injury that you're accommodating for and an app really can't know that or, or help you accommodate for that or help you. It can put you in this, in what it considers an ideal position, but maybe that's too big of a change for you right now or, or they're, you know, handling individual needs, you know, whether, again, whether it's like a post-surgical indication or shoe sizes or, man, I just don't feel comfortable on steep terrain that I, and I feel like I should, but I got this new bike and it doesn't feel right to me. Delving into that nuance is something more easily done in person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you do a lot of follow-up or any follow-up? Is that part of the process where, yeah, you have somebody, you fit them and then you're going to hear from them in a few days or weeks or whatever and and see how it goes. It is a follow-up is absolutely a part of the process. So after, after our first session, I say, I need you to get six to eight hours in on that bike and I want you to accumulate some feedback during that time. And then Mm -hmm. we're going to eat, at least have a chat at least over the phone or email. And if you're happy with it, great. It, or if we, you know, or in some cases, uh, we're making an incremental change mm-hmm. and I want to take another look at it and then yeah. say, okay, you tolerated this. Let's make, let's change things the rest of the way to what I think you're capable of, of handling or what would be ideal for you. Yeah. But we just, it just wouldn't be in our best interest to have a massive departure from your old position because it was, it was maybe working for you, but it was different enough from this new position that we want to kind of break it up into chunks. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You can't really give the, the algorithm, the feedback and say, Oh, this still hurts. And it's like, well, I don't know what else to do. I I told you how to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like my foot's numb. Well, your knee angle looks really good. So I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But it does, again, it does offer some good, you know, it takes care of a lot of that low hanging fruit with, joint angles and mat- doing a pretty good job with matching a basic mobility screen with, with joint angles. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Adam, uh, thanks again for taking the time to chat with us. Always so many topics, uh, to go over with bike fit and mountain biking. And, uh, yeah, really appreciate your help with that. 
Thanks for having me on, Jeff. This is, uh, it's been a blast. I am always happy to, uh, always happy to talk bike fit and, uh, uh those questions of, they were, they were great. I had a, had a great time chatting. Shucks. Thank you. Well, you can get more information at apexchirobellingham.com. You can connect with Adam and uh, find out more about the services that he offers. So we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.